Royal, number 289. Great, yes, Maria Royal with Legislative Council, and we are looking at a draft uh, strike all amendment to S289. It's draft 2.0, <coughs> dated yesterday, and hopefully this incorporates uh, some of the issues that came up last week in the committee's discussion on uh, the net neutrality bill. I'll give you kind of, a, at first, just a broad <coughs> overview of what's in here, uh, a findings Finding. section, um, which Finding. reworks the findings to be a little bit more tailored to the proposals in this bill, the specific substantive proposals. Also addresses some of the issues on the findings that you raised we talked about last week, some tweaks and so on. Uh, then it has a certification process whereby providers can certify compliance with net neutrality, and that certification would be required for government contracts, uh, state contracts. So that proposal is there, as well as the Attorney General's uh, disclosure proposal, and we'll go through all of this. Uh, and then finally, a report by the AG's office uh, in consultation with Department of Public Service on net neutrality issues generally, a report back to the legislature. So. Those are the big topics, and we'll just start going through. I think I, I tried to highlight in yellow where there were changes, um, and, and we can talk about them. So for example, the first three findings, uh, there were no changes there. The fourth finding, uh, you'll recall that that lead-in language said more than 20 years ago, the FCC, et cetera, and you wanted just to specifically reference the date. Uh, so. That was the change, the only change in that finding number four. Uh, similarly, in finding number five, the original language said most Vermonters do not have. I think based on the discussion, you were, at least for the time being, um, wanted to simply say many Vermonters because you couldn't actually, or you hadn't been prepared to quantify at that time how many Vermonters. Um, then, oh, in Section 8, there were questions about the language, the specific kind of terms of art used in the telecommunications industry, specifically the light touch versus utility style. So what I did, just to clarify, I left 8 alone for now. You can, of course, change it however you want. <coughs> but then in Finding 9, I took a quote directly from the most recent order, which kind of sheds light on their approach and the use of those terms and just directly quoted and cited it. So we can, that's a new finding in number nine. So as explained by the FCC, we reversed the commission's abrupt shift two years ago to heavy handed utility style regulation of broadband internet access service and returned to the light touch framework under which a free and open internet underwent rapid and unprecedented growth for almost two decades. We eliminate burdensome regulation that stifles innovation and deters investment and empower Americans to choose the broadband internet access service that best fits their need. So again, that's just a statement of the shift in policy and the, you can see the language uh, that's used pretty consistently throughout all of the FCC's orders. Then in finding number 10, the original kind of lead-in language, which I think you had some concerns about. Uh, I can just get there. Uh, oh, okay, it was finding number nine, but this was the finding that said many analysts have questioned whether the new policy of non-regulation will achieve the results intended, da, da, da. Um, so I think there was concern about, well, who, what analyst, et cetera. So for now, uh, I just put lead in language that says, that, and this would be a finding by the General Assembly, it is not likely the FCC's regulatory approach will achieve the intended results in Vermont. And then the rest of that is the same. The policy does little, if anything, to overcome financial challenges of bringing broadband to hard to reach locations. Then I added, um, for your consideration, uh, because these are the two kind of competing economic theories. One, unfettered uh, uh, growth or unregulated uh, internet service will lead to greater 
broadband investment and deployment. That's the most recent approach adopted by the FCC. In terms of the prior kind of economic theory that supported the 2015 net neutrality rules, that approach has come to be known as what's called a virtuous circle of innovation. And so I did two things. One referenced that that is the economic theory advanced by the FCC in 2010, the virtuous circle of innovation, um, seems more relevant to the market conditions in Vermont. And then in terms of what that theory is, and for you to decide um, as a policy matter, as explained in the FCC's 2010 order, the Internet's openness <laughs> enables a virtuous circle of innovation in which new uses of the network, including new content, applications, services, and devices, lead to increased end-user demand for broadband, which drives network improvements, which in turn lead to further innovative network uses. Novel improved or lower cost offerings introduced by content, application service, and device providers spur end user demand and encourage broadband providers to expand their networks and invest in new broadband technologies. So that was the economic theory that kind of underpinned the original 2015 net neutrality rules. Actually, the 2010, the very original uh, net neutrality rules, and that was upheld uh, by the Federal Court of Appeals. So those are the two kind of competing policies. Um, in terms of uh, an additional finding added in 13, as affirmed by the FCC five years later, 2015, the key insight of the virtuous cycle is that broadband providers have both the incentive and the ability to act as gatekeepers, standing between edge providers and consumers. As gatekeepers, they can block access altogether. They can target competitors, including competitors in their own video services, and they can extract <coughs> unfair tolls. Um, the next finding, uh, Excuse me, yes, when, go when ahead. When will stop open internet or the FCC? 2015. 2015. Right. So the FCC <coughs> made several attempts before 2015. Uh, 2010 issued an order that was struck <coughs> down by the courts, and then they came back. That's when they reclassified internet service as a telecommunication service, and by doing that, they had greater authority, and that's when they issued the 2015 rule. So there were attempts before then, um, but the two big orders were the 2010 attempt struck down, and then the 2015 order, which has been held upheld on appeal. Uh, that's the Verizon case which, however, uh, has been appealed to the United States Supreme Court. So that legal issue is actually still pending as well. So uh, let's see. I think we went through 14 um, and 15, 15 in particular you wanted to hold for now, and I realize some of these might change based on where you ultimately decide to go um, in the draft. Um, the particular issue in 16, for example, I changed uh, because I think the original set, language said that the state should enact bright line rules. Um, you're not under this proposal, you're not doing that. You are requiring adherence to the rules in certain circumstances. So you may want to rework that depending on what actually uh, you'd like the state to do. Um, then, yeah. Ron? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when you said bright line rules, does rules <coughs> have the meaning of rule making there? I mean, well, it's a reference to the rules in the 2015 order, okay. very specifically. And I think, I think I did try, as much as possible, try to cite and clarify that those are uh, the specific rules that you've been talking about. So under the order, the 2015 order, <coughs> there were the three rules, no blocking, no throttling, no mm -hmm. paid prioritization. Then there was kind of what's known as the general conduct rule, which is no unreasonable interference or unreasonable or disadvantaging, kind of a very broad, safe all provision. And then the fifth 
kind of rule um, was a disclosure requirement that you have to notify consumers um, what your practices are. So the bright line rules are are the previous FCC rules. Yes, yes. Those are all that those were the two thousand and fifteen net neutrality rules. Okay. And so you require is actually problematic. It said an act before and you the question is do you want to are you if you're gonna require adherence for purposes of a government contract, mm -hmm. you know, maybe just clarifying that you're right. not requiring Probably something it we seem, should do. Yeah, yeah, seems where you're going, but I didn't want to because it's not where the rest of the bill is. So I think we would want to tighten that. that piece. Sure. If we keep that in there. Yep. Yep. Again, if you, if you if you even want to keep it. If we keep the contracting piece in there. Yep. Procurement. Yep. Uh, so then, some of the findings that follow, and we can go through them, um, starting on 17, kind of address the legal issues, the legal analysis. Um, in this instance, for example, if you do government contracts, uh, the reason why that might not be preempted is because it um, falls kind of within the doctrine known as the market participant doctrine, where the state is acting as a consumer, not a regulator, and purchasing a service. And in those instances, um, the state, states have been held to be um, shielded from any uh, preemption, commerce clause preemption. But we'll, we'll start reading through those now um, and make sure they <coughs> make sense and are consistent with what you like. So in 17, in its most recent order, the FCC preempts states from enacting local net neutrality rules However, it is not clear that the FCC has such preemption authority. This is one of several legal issues raised in a consolidated lawsuit <coughs> pending in the United States, United States District Court of Appeals. So that's the lawsuit that the Vermont Attorney General, 21 other state attorney generals, have um, joined in as well as other groups, um, trade, uh, groups and nonprofit groups, etc. Then finding 18 in the restoring internet freedom order, the FCC indicates its intention to restore the Federal Trade Commission as the federal regulatory entity with oversight and enforcement authority over broadband internet access service. Um, again, kind of start beginning to clarify that this is a uh, becoming more of a consumer protection issue uh, to be regulated through the antitrust laws or the Consumer Protection Act. That that's, that's the, sort of the new regime um, that's uh, uh, being established now. So to further clarify what that means in, in finding 19, as explained by the FCC, in the unlikely event that ISPs engage in conduct that harms internet openness. We find that utility style regulation is unnecessary to address such conduct. Other legal regimes, particularly antitrust law and the FTC's authority under Section 5 of the FTC Act to prohibit unfair and deceptive practices, provide protections to consumers. So the Attorney General enforces the antitrust laws in the state under the Consumer Protection Act. The FTC does similar at the federal level. So then, um, and again, these findings are still for your consideration, uh, but to the extent there still may be preemption issues, and there uh, probably are with almost anything that you do, but um, less so depending on the approach that you take. Finding 20 specifies that the consumer protection and net neutrality requirements put forward in this act do not conflict with the FCC's policy of non-regulation. The FCC has chosen to deregulate broadband internet access service to promote broadband investment and deployment. As previously stated, a non-regulation policy is unlikely to advance those goals in Vermont whereas the state standards proposed in this act will simultaneously protect consumers from unfair and anti-competitive business practices, promote innovation and internet usage, and consistent with the FCC's policy objectives, likely promote broadband investment and deployment in our state. 
21, the proposals in this act represent state efforts to address the issue of internet openness in a manner that is consistent with the FCC's preemption of local net neutrality rules. For example, and this is when we get into the whole market participant doctrine and the state's traditional police powers. And finding 22, the requirement that ISP certify compliance with consumer protection and net neutrality standards in order to obtain a government contract for broadband internet access service falls within the market participant exception to a dormant commerce clause challenge. And then citing the Vermont Supreme Court for what that doctrine stands for in finding 23 is explained by the Vermont Supreme Court when acting as a market participant the government should enjoy the unrestricted power to determine those with whom it will deal with respect to government contracts specifically the court held procurement laws are for the benefit of the state not prospective bidders and therefore no one has a right to sell to the government that which the government does not wish to buy so again when the state is acting as a consumer in the marketplace, not as a regulator. Uh, it's given. So <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, with respect to the AG disclosure requirement and finding 24, with respect to the mandated disclosure required by this act, wherein an ISP must report to the state whether it is or is not in compliance with net neutrality standards. This requirement and the transparency it affords is a reasonable exercise of the state's traditional police powers, and such disclosures will support the state's efforts to monitor consumer protection and economic factors in Vermont, particularly with regard to competition, business practices, and consumer choice. Uh, and then finding 25. Um, Proposal from proposed finding from the Attorney General's office. I think you had wanted to reference the number of Vermonters who commented during the rulemaking process at the federal level. Net neutrality is clearly an important topic for many Vermonters. Nearly 50,000 comments were submitted to the FCC during the rulemaking process regarding the Restoring Internet Freedom Order. Thus, transparency with respect to the network management practices of ISPs doing business in Vermont. <coughs> will likely be of great interest to many Vermonters going forward. And then 26 is uh, similar to the uh, last finding that you had in H860. In short, Vermont, more so than the FCC, is in the best position to decide for itself what the needs of its constituencies are and what policies best serve the public interest. Internet consumer protection and net neutrality standards are needed in Vermont. Any incidental burden on interstate commerce that results from the requirements of this act is far outweighed by the compelling interest the state is advancing here. Were there any other findings that you wanted to include? And is there anything in here that you want to rework or take out? Have you seen the uh, Attorney General's or heard that talk on the Attorney General's? You've got some. Well, I have just some thoughts I'll share with the committee. But right. That's for you all. Would this be a good time to do that? <clears throat> to look at the two? Well, I don't have anything drafted or, or proposed for you, but uh, why don't you let uh, your legislative council work you through the rest all of right, the good. and then I'll well, testify. Well, of course, uh, the committee and the legislature works by uh, majority, but I don't. I think we had at a previous version of this that some analyst thinks that this is going to inhibit the deployment of uh, broadband, and I'm not, I'm not convinced myself as a minority here that the state uh, jumping in here is going to uh, uh, promote innovation and uh, and create more broadband deployment in the state. But it's, uh, it's a majority decision. I just, the vendors are telling us that they would more likely back off, and we're saying the opposite. So uh, that's my uh, take on that one. That they would more likely back off on 
if we're going to start regulating and heavily, that's the take up that I heard from various vendors. Mm -hmm. So, uh, obviously, the General Assembly can find whatever they want by a majority. But so, I, I, I'm not convinced that that's uh, an so accurate statement. So, your objection is to the use of an anal some analysts think? Or well, no. I mean, it would make more sense, I would think, that some analysts, I mean, some analysts can think whatever they want, but if I'm the General Assembly, I'm not signing up to that as a, oh, in the General Assembly. I mean, but the General Assembly finds things by majority, so mm -hmm. I'm just saying that's statement number 10 is problematic to me as a uh, as a person that's in the General Assembly. So Go ahead. But I could be in the minority again. If we are moving towards uh, transparency and procurement only as opposed to consumer protection. So 680 was consumer protection. I would say it's, it's all consumer protection, but the transparency is not just for state contracts. For state contracts, you actually have to comply with net neutrality. Right. So we have that aspect, which is centered around just our, our rights for procurement. States' rights, yep. Right. S-289 has passed the Senate. And then we're talking about the obligations that currently exist around transparency um, and public disclosure. There are disclosure requirements, yes, under the 2017 order. You have, the AG's office has proposed an additional disclosure requirement to the state on whether or not you're complying with net neutrality mm -hmm. standards in the, the 2015 order. Whether you com continue to, even though you don't have to legally, because that order has been, it's all subject to litigation, mm -hmm. but repealed <coughs> um, going forward, uh, the disclosure is whether or not you're continuing to adhere to those net neutrality rules right. or not, whether or not. It's not a requirement. And so the piece, the piece is in 680. We are talking about setting aside have to do with, um, have to do with really the build out accessing our it's really all of those are accessing the build out of our networks here in Vermont, like being able to build in Vermont. Right? I mean all of them have to do with permitting, right? So whether or, or not you're able to grants do business, or yeah. there are there's several proposals, right. I'm just trying to think about the very, when we're thinking about these findings, mm -hmm. if you know what it is that we're actually going to end up doing. So right. if we pull those out, if we pull those out and we're limit what we're talking about to just um, requiring public dis disclosures, notification of public disclosure, whatever it is, mm -hmm. and the procurement, then we Right, and I did and so that yeah. then does 10. I'm still, you know, I'm still really struck by the, you know, rationale that the FCC put out, which is that this is needed to build out. So it makes, you know. Let's go through to the end like we were doing and sort of mm -hmm. get a feel for the overall thing. Okay. So going on to section two, and this is largely the version that the Senate sent over to you, an S-289, with some tweets, which I'll explain, that are highlighted in, in yellow. But just as a refresher, um, this is the Secretary of Administration coming up with the process whereby a provider can certify that it does comply with net neutrality rules. And that certification would be required for any government contract. So this is just the process. 
and uh, an articulation of what the rules are. Robin, yeah. um, this is a question I asked last week, and I think I also, I, I believe I asked you, and I think I asked Clay as well, whether regulatory agreements are state contracts? Like for site, siting a tower, is that a state contract? So this is uh, Clay Purvis for the record, the Department of Public Service. No, that's, um, that's a, a regulatory permit, so it's not a contract. Um, you know, contract and state government would be the state purchasing products or services for use by state government. Permits that one receives under Title 30, such as 248A, those are um, this regulatory permission to proceed on on a project. So that's the distinction. Okay. So a contract is not all agreements. For our purposes, all agreements are not contracts. It has to be a purchase of goods and goods or services. I, I wouldn't consider uh, a permit under 248A to be an agreement or a contract that is a, um, it is an order of the Public Utility Commission. Um, they have a statutory obligation to hear, uh, to take petitions and hear cases under uh, 248A and uh, if the petitioner has met the requirements of of the statute, and the board makes the findings that those requirements have been met. They're they're obligated to issue the the, uh, the permit. So, uh, it, yeah, it's not an agreement. It's uh, or a contract. It is a it is an order of the board granting a certificate of public good. Thank you. Okay. Um, do you want to go through this word by word, or how? What's your, what makes sense? Probably the pregnant portions we should at least. What's that? <coughs> I think, I'm sorry? Yes, the pregnant portions I think we should. Okay. Okay. This is from 680. Yes. No. This, the 680 and 289 had yeah. very similar proposals. Yeah. Um, 289 is only government contracts. Yeah. And this is essentially that language with some tweaks, which I'll go over. But you had a very similar government contracts proposal as one of your many proposals in H680. So it, it will look similar. Okay. In your House proposed language, for example, though, you had the Public Utility Commission adopting by rule, right? So there, there are some dis distinctions, but you also went a, a very different uh, took a very different regulatory approach. Okay. Since this is limited to government contracts, it's within the Secretary of Administration's purview, arguably. But so it will look, we've been through a lot of this, and it will look very familiar. The tweaks that I did make um, really were to true this up with the 2015 order with how those rules are described, um, the exceptions to those rules, and then I'll get to it in a minute, but added a provision um, that references the 2015 order and all of the regulations and advisory opinions that have been issued interpreting what the, what the rules mean. So I think that will make more sense to you when, as we get there. So, but just as a refresher that the uh, providers to get a certification does not engage in any of the following practices in Vermont. Blocking lawful content subject to reasonable network management. I think in the Senate language it said subject to reasonable network manage management practices disclosed to consumers. Solely for the purpose of keeping the language very consistent with the 2015 rules, I changed the language to just subject to reasonable network management. You'll see that down in subdivision two, the disclosure under the rule, the disclosure is made to consumers. So all of these rules, all these practices go to consumers. I just, there's no substantive change here. Again, it's just to be consistent with the federal rules. Um, similar change in subdivision B with respect to the throttling provision. Uh, 
subdivision C is the paid prioritization, um, which has the waiver provision in subsection C, which we'll look at. Subdivision D, this is the general standard conduct, the no unreasonable interference. I highlighted that whole section because in the Senate language it didn't actually include the exemption for reasonable network management. I don't think that was intentional. I think the purpose in general has always been to be consistent. So just, again, making it as, yeah. Does reasonable mean something? There's a definition, reasonable network yeah. management. Um, so then you'll see, so all the definitions have remained the same, I believe, um, all consistent with the federal definitions of these terms. What's new is this subsection E, and we'll just read through it once. It is the intent of the General Assembly in enacting this section to incorporate into statute certain provisions of the FCC's 2015 Open Internet Order. I won't read the rest. The terms and requirements of this section shall be interpreted broadly and any exceptions interpreted narrowly using the 2015 Open Internet Order and relevant FCC advisory opinions, rulings, and regulations as persuasive guidance. Is that supposed to be order on remand or demand? I'm sorry? Um, on line 13. Line 13. Report an order on remand? I believe so. But I'll double check, make sure that's right. So in terms of the uh, terms being interpreted broadly, exceptions interpreted narrowly, that's uh, just one of the general canons of statutory construction that the Vermont Supreme Court and other courts and other jurisdictions have applied to consumer protection provisions. But maybe more importantly, um, for this issue here, referencing all of the FCC's advisory opinions and regulations to the extent that they clarify or shed light on how these terms are interpreted, that could be helpful, right? Because you know that there are a lot of um, technical issues. What is throttling? What does that mean specifically? How do you? And the order, you know, this is 400 pages of the 2015 order. The actual rules are on five pages. But there's a lot of explanation, not just of legal issues, but what the intention is behind the use of these terms. So that's why it's there, may be helpful um, going forward. So then, um, then this next several provisions, I think we've been over them. You're already familiar in terms of who needs to certify. Uh, again, it's for government contracts. So section three is just a requirement that under Administrative Bulletin 3.5, that's just the general bulletin on state procurement contracts, uh, that that be amended to include terms um, requiring that ISP certify that they're compliant. So if you go through the procurement process, Administrative Bulletin 3.5, um, as part of that process, you have to certify compliance with net neutrality rules. Section 4 is also related to the executive branch um, agency of digital services as part of their many uh, responsibilities to ensure that state government contracts for broadband service contains terms and conditions uh, requiring providers to certify compliance. Uh, then uh, section 5, this is the same requirement uh, for any s internet service contracts for the legislative branch and section 6 uh, contracts for the judicial branch, so all three branches of government. And again, that's uh, the Senate passed language, including Section 7, which is an application specifying that these requirements would apply to all government contracts entered into or renewed on or after July 1st of this year. So very sim almost identical to the Senate language. So then Section 8 is the AG's disclosure requirement. I did not, uh, I don't believe I made any substantive changes uh, based on, to the language that you reviewed last week. There was still the issue that the AG raised about what governmental entity, the Attorney General's office or the Department of Public Service, should be responsible for 
posting the disclosures. Again, this is the disclosure of whether or not you're complying. Um, so that's just something that's still out there to be determined. Uh, but otherwise, that provision has remained the same. What's new to the draft is Section 9, which is the study. So we'll go through that since you haven't seen it. We'll go through pretty quickly. On, on or before December 15th, the Attorney General, consultation with the Commissioner of Public Service and with input from industry and consumer stakeholders, shall submit findings and recommendations in the form of a report or draft legislation to the relevant committees of jurisdiction, reflecting whether and to what extent the state should enact net neutrality rules applicable to Internet service providers offering broadband in Vermont. Among other things, the Attorney General shall consider, one, the extent to which Vermont is preempted from enacting net neutrality rules, particularly with respect to proposals in H860. Two, the status of litigation concerning implementation of the recent order as well as the 2015 order. Three, the scope and status of net neutrality rules proposed or enacted in other jurisdictions. Four, methods for and recommendations pertaining to the enforcement of net neutrality requirements. Five, methods for and recommendations pertaining to tracking broadband investment and deployment in Vermont and otherwise monitoring market conditions in the state. Six, proposed courses of action that balance the benefits to society that the communications <coughs> industry brings with actual and potential harms the industry may pose to consumers and then any other factors. And that's it. Does that seem consistent with the information that you were at least hoping to get back in a report, or is there anything else that you wanted to include? It's got the essence, I think, where we all want to be better. That's good. Okay. So on page eight. Yes. Um, line 21. So does not engage. Um, and the means for that, number one, what is that, subsection one? Under big B, B, subsection one. The means for proving that will be determined by the Secretary of Administration, right? Okay, so demonstrates. So that could be we don't do it, like just you know, check the box. This is we do, we abide by net neutrality. This certification is required for a government contract. It's separate from a disclosure requirement on whether or not you adhere. And so, so does this require, and, and does the governor's order require uh, some sort of technical demonstration or what is, this is different than, you know, just self-certification, right? It leaves it open. It's the secretary shall develop a process by which a company certifies. So how they do that and what satisfies, um, you, you know, that process is left a little bit open. The secretary in subsection B, it specifies that a certificate shall be granted uh, to an internet ser service provider that demonstrates and the secretary finds that the provider, so far as they are providing service in Vermont, does not engage in. So how that is determined, 
you know, it may be a statement, it may be here are our practices that we're required to disclose already under the 2017 order. You know, you're, I think you're getting the questions of how will they know, how will they enforce, maybe I don't know the answer to those questions. And this isn't so prescriptive as to say this is what you need to submit. And so for this piece, this has to do with contracting, the ability yes. to contract yes. with the state. And so, which we have the right to regulate. You're opening the window again. Procurement. I mean, nobody can make us buy something. Correct. It's a pretty well-established exception to a Commerce Clause challenge when the state is acting as a consumer. It's not limitless authority, and there can be situations where you uh, end up regulating a market by your requirements, but that's, I don't think that that would necessarily apply here. And so the minimum requirement of the Secretary of Administration really here is some means for the provider to certify mm -hmm. that they're in Yeah, and we can, I can look at quickly the executive order, uh, the language used there. Maybe. Maybe not as quickly as I thought. There we go. Uh, so this, the executive order says that uh, following directive for all state agencies all agencies that contract with providers shall include net neutrality protections, um, specifically no blocking, no throttling, no paid prioritization. Uh, as soon as practical, the agency of administration shall amend the state's procurement and contracting procedures, which is that bulletin 3.5, um, as necessary and appropriate to comply with this directive. Um, each state agency that procures telecom services shall cooperate with the Agency of Administration and BGS in implementing this order. State agencies must receive approval from the Agency of Digital Services and the Secretary of Administration before procuring internet <coughs> services. Uh, so that's pretty much a requirement, but it doesn't specify anything beyond that. So it's the FCC's position that we can't do anything. It's established law that we can, that no one can make us buy something. And so, this is, yeah. The FCC has issued a very broad preemption of state attempts to implement local net neutrality rules. There is a pretty well established market participant doctrine mm -hmm. where states you know, unless the, uh, unless Congress has specifically said, you know, spoken to the issue, which Congress has not in this instance, that when states are not regulating commerce, whether it's interstate or interstate commerce, but they're simply buying goods and services like any other consumer, they can choose, like any other consumer, who they want to do business with. So every consumer under the 2017, 2017 order has the right to decide whether or not to have a contract with this provider, broadband provider, or this provider. Assuming they have a choice, this one does not comply with net neutrality, I'm going to go with this one. I mean, that's the basic premise, is that it's informed consumer choice. Mm -hmm. So this would be a similar argument that the state, for purposes of buying internet service for its employees or in public buildings, can make a similar choice like any other consumer about who they want to, with whom they want to do business. There, it's not limitless, but I don't think it runs afoul mm -hmm. of the preemption provision here. Mike. So one of the differences between the executive order and this is that <coughs> they were saying the secretary has to find that the internet service provider is compliant. The word finds is rather open-ended, right? I mean, there isn't any, anything that says how he's going to make that, that how the secretary is going to make that determination. Right. It is pretty open. Um, 
So it could be big or small. Right. Uh, and I don't know, um, obviously this order went into effect so I'm, the secretary, I'm sure, could speak to how they intend to implement the executive order and what they're going to be requiring and so on. I just, I don't know. Okay. But this is consistent with the executive order? It is consistent with it. The um, executive order does have a, a waiver provision. Waivers to these procedures may be granted by the secretary upon written upon receipt of a written justification from a state agency and a finding by the secretary that a waiver would serve a legitimate and significant interest for the significant interest of the state um, the senate s289 language doesn't have a similar mm -hmm. waiver provision um, um, so the uh Internet service provider, the ISP certifying that it's compliant, is different than disclosure of practices, right. although the, those could be included in the certification process. Is that correct? Say that again. Those disclosure of practices could be part of the certification process. Well, there is a disclosure requirement mm -hmm. that it's already required under the 2015 order. So they, all providers um, have to disclose to consumers accurate information on their net neutrality. So there is. That, so that has to happen. That's part of way. getting certified. Yeah. Yep, that is considered one of the five 2015 mm -hmm. rules. Um, and so the, the, the power of this is in Informing consumers of the disclosure of requirement the, of the of the certification, the compliance, so that consumers can make a an informed decision. Is that oops uh, accurate? Uh, po possibly, I, um, the requirement on certification is uh, for just for government contracts. So. Okay, so the disclosure is everybody. The, the disclosure is, is for every provider providing broadband service in Vermont mm -hmm. would need to disclose uh, to a state agency, whether it's the AG's office or Department of Public Service, whether or not they adhere to net neutrality rules. That's the, the public disclosure that's proposed by the AG's office. The certification is you must certify that you comply with net neutrality and that certification is necessary if you want a government contract. Okay, so the certificate is not Good housekeeping seal of approval. Well, it's only the required of the certificate of compliance is only required for providers who want government contracts. Mm -hmm. So, a, a company, and, and I don't know if there are any ISPs that are that don't have state contracts, um, still has to disclose, but they won't necessarily have a certification of compliance. Right. So if they don't want a government contract, they don't want to do business with the state, and they don't want to comply with net neutrality rules, there's no certification requirement. There is a disclosure requirement. You have to disclose to the AG's office, Department of Public Service, who then will make that information available on a publicly accessible website. So presumably a consumer can go online, pull up a website, look at all the providers in the state, and just see, oh, this company adheres to net neutrality. This one doesn't. It's and is that adherence or not in an in easily understood, 
understandable language? I mean, is it a yes or no check, or is it a pages of fine print for consumers to wade through? That would depend. So the way this is drafted, it says the disclosure shall be in a form and manner prescribed by the Attorney General. So presumably it, they would come up with, come up with a way that is consumer friendly. friendly. Have we thought at all about who's going to sign this and when they sign it? And I'm, where I'm coming from with the question is... Sign what? The what well, it's the page, what page had it where the, uh, the commissioner will find... The secretary, uh, secretary develops a process, yes. They'll be, <coughs> excuse me, they'll be looking at, where is that, can you help me? Sure, that's on page eight. Yep, so the secretary comes up with the process, and this would apply to all contracts beginning July 1st. What I'm trying to get a feel for is how many contracts there will be out in the world. Um, I don't know. We'll, the, I, I really don't know, you would ask the secretary. Well, the, this, uh, okay, because we'll have to figure out who the signer would be, because the signers is going to be a very limited oh. number, but they're ISBs, if on the other hand they're... Uh, you mean signing for the state? There was no signing for it. Uh. It's, uh, oh, it's ISP, Museum right there. The Internet Service Provider that demonstrates and the Secretary finds those two things bring you into um, insofar as the provider is engaged in the provision of broadband broadband internet access service that they do not engage in any of the following practices in Vermont that only down through A through E. Right. I so, was just trying, but if it's yeah. ISPs, there's a relatively limited number of ISPs. Yes, and the Secretary of Digital Services can better explain how many internet contracts they enter into with how many different providers in the state and you asking Who's going to sign the certification? Well, who, who the parties are going to be to it. And I, I didn't care for the purpose of that. Who the parties were so much as I was trying to get a sense on size. Can we, can we get ADS to give us the list of who's contracts with the state? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we, <coughs> so we know how many contracts are. I don't know the answer to that. Well, can we get them to give us the answer? <coughs> what, what, um, what section? What section? So we know how many ISPs we're talking about in, in terms of the state contracting. If it's all of them or one of them. Or <coughs> well, I, we didn't get to it yet, but I, how um, many branches of government I, would this apply to? Under this proposal, it's all three branches of government. So any legislative contracts? You can hear so, from the our legislative IT person about. Well, that's a one that have to. To the extent that whatever entities right now contract for internet service. Okay, but that defines it. In a, yeah, you can ask Quinn Yeah. Is he coming in tomorrow? He's scheduled for tomorrow. Oh. And he may actually do the legislative contract as well and the judicial contract. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Right. Okay. Um, let's get uh, Chris up. I got one last question. Oh, please. Uh, uh, so, the executive order, that's in effect right now? I believe so. Uh, as soon as practical, but in no event later than April 1st. Yeah. Oh, so. The agency yeah. shall amend. Blah, blah, blah. I think I saw the that they have. So, this yes. my real question is, has there been a legal challenge to it? I'm not or aware anticipated. of it. I'm not aware of anything yet. Okay. Clay, are you looking for? I'm seeing if anyone from the administration might be able to answer that question. I'm sorry to... Um, Warren has a question. We don't know who to look at answering. So we're looking towards you. Whether, whether the executive order is in effect? Um, whether there's been any litigation? No, not that I'm aware of. Not yet. Of course, it's been in effect for two days. Thanks. <laughs> That's another question. Uh, does, that, does the executive order apply to new contracts, or does it apply to contracts in currently in existence? 
let's see how the, what the language is. Um, we have, I don't know if we have an application section. It takes effect April 1st. That's when the bulletin is amended. Oh, this directive. I don't know that no. they specify beyond that. I th so the short answer is I'm not sure that they have an application. So I guess if your contract is not being renewed for some period of time, I'm not sure whether you'd have to comply before then. I don't know. They might have that. They, that might be part of their policy and have a, an application, or maybe I just haven't seen it yet. But. Anything else from Red? Thank you. Okay. Chair, members of the committee, for the record, Christopher Curtis, Chief of Public Protection at the Office of the Attorney General. Uh, just generally speaking, uh, I think what you have before you uh, accomplishes what you have uh, tasked uh, 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 your, your counsel with, with doing, which is setting out some very strong findings um, and then three primary um, actions. One is disclosure to consumers and policymakers. One is uh, procurement policy. And one is a working group or a task force to continue to keep you and the other members uh, of the, the body apprised of developments uh, in this rapidly changing area. So with, with that said, um, I want to just with respect to the findings, I think they're, they're very strong, and I think they set out the rationale uh, that you're, uh, and the, frankly, the, the balance that you're attempting to strike here. Um, I may have some feedback for uh, your counsel about ordering, because I always find that it's actually stronger to set out the, um, essentially, the state's role, the state's priority. There's a lot in here that starts out with the FCC order, uh, either of 2017 or the FCC order of 2015. Um, it's, purely, it's really for your committee to decide how you want to do that. I might structure it, uh, frankly, as more of a state's rights or state's interest provision first, setting out the consumer protection rationale for why you're doing what you're doing. Those elements are all in here, though. So um, you know, it's, it's more a question of how you want to structure those, those findings. Um, but in terms of making an impact and showing Vermonters right up front why you're doing what you're doing, I think leading with those consumer protection, the traditional police powers of the state that um, allow you to act in this area, I find that to be a, a nice way to proceed. But again, purely your election, I can talk some with your, with your counsel about that uh, if you'd like, um, but that's at your discretion. Um, I guess so. C certainly happy happy to do that Could you say make yourself? <laughs> <laughs> with respect to um, I did have a couple of comments with respect to uh, the parts of the bill that deal with the uh, Attorney General's office specifically um, this is the working group or task force provision um, that's near the end um, Specifically with respect to the study, I think that instead of limiting, uh, or uh, I know that this, this is this is actually uh, page 14, where uh, you're setting out among other things the attorney general shall consider for purposes of reporting back to you. Um, I would go much broader and just have the language around federal and state landscapes essentially consistent. So, um, and I, I can provide this to your legislative council, but I would just simply say the um, scope and status of federal law related to net neutrality and ISP regulation. That's the whole ambit. Right here you simply say the extent to which Vermont is preempted. But to the extent that you're interested in Commerce Clause issues, a whole range of, of other potential issues and discussions that may or may not be happening at the federal level, uh, I wouldn't want to narrow this. Uh, 
And then consistent with that, you already have that in the state section, so you make the mirror images, the scope and status of net neutrality rules, and ISP regulation proposed or enacted in other jurisdictions, meaning presumably the states. Um, so just make those consistent so they're as broad as possible so we can really do the, the deep dive that you are asking us to do. Um, methods for and recommendations per pertaining to tracking broadband investment and deployment in Vermont, that seems to me it's more directly related to DPS, but because we will consult with, with DPS, of course, um, that's just a little outside of our traditional area of expertise. So I don't know if you need to reflect that specifically. It's kind of upfront that we'll consult with them, but I just want to make the point that that's would probably that kind of economic analysis in terms of the regulatory landscape in the state would probably more fall into the purview of DPS. So I just flag that. What page is that? Yeah, that's that? the same page. It's 15, the it's recommendation 15. number five. What line? Lines on my copy it's 17, but uh, if I'm hearing other people say 15. Oh, it's page 15. That's what he asked. 11, what page? Oh, okay. Yeah, I have draft 2.0 and uh, on this date, but for some reason my numbers and pages are not uh, <coughs> matching up. So page 15, line 11? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there we go. Yeah, methods for and recommendations per pertaining to tracking. So, so. Mr. Chair, yes. I got a question on that. Mm -hmm. Could this get into pri proprietary information? I mean, do companies generally tell the state how much money they're spending on stuff? That's a great question. I think, you know, one of the things that it might be uh, useful is that kind of thing can actually invite um, stakeholder participation and discussion, and to the extent that there's proprietary limitations on what they'll share, they certainly make us aware of that. Um, but it might be a good way to just get folks around the table to start having the discussion. What does this look like in Vermont? What's the future going to be? Um, what do you anticipate? Um, you know, how all of this is going to sort of unfold and transpire. And those are conversations that we haven't had with industry before. Uh, I don't know if DPS is or is not. Typically, when we do a working group uh, <coughs> where we're tasked with coming up with recommendations, we do stakeholder in involvement. And that includes right. the general public and includes everybody that would have, an, uh, you know, a stake yeah. in the outcome. So, you know, to the extent that you're asking us to look look at that, we can certainly do that, in part, and we would want to do that in partnership with our our sister state agency, and of course, anybody that wants to be involved in those discussions or give feedback, we can. And to the extent that there are limitations, I'm sure they'll make us aware of that. Okay. So, but it's a good it's good question. Aspirational, perhaps. Well, yeah, but you know, they, they, it may be that uh, folks are willing to share kind of in very general terms, sort of what the opportunities are, what are the challenges, what's, to the extent that there are limitations in a rural uh, state like sure. Vermont that has a limited population, sort of what, what are the obstacles? So yeah. It might help things work better. Sure. Uh, okay. All that kind of nice. thing. Um, I think that, uh, you know, to the extent that there's a question around the certification, that's really a question for the, the secretary to ask. I think you, you know, my view on that is you probably want to give the administration some flexibility to determine how they make that determination um, and issue a certificate of some kind. But again, the, the key aspect of, of all of this is there are two ways to look at it. Is what is the require, what is the state requiring of an entity in order to uh, gain access to the state contracts. The other way to look at it, and I think the proper way to look at it is, frankly, it's the state putting a requirement essentially on itself that it's not going to enter into contracts. And this gets to the testimony you heard from your counsel that basically said it's the state acting as a consumer itself, making a determination about with whom it will enter into a contract. So the way it's written here, it almost appears that, um, you know, this is some kind of a requirement for the commercial actors, but really it's a requirement for the, the state. It's information that the state will use to make an assessment of whether or not it will enter into a contract with a commercial entity. So um, I think you're, you're on solid ground there vis-a-vis -vis procurement uh, policy, uh, and that's reflected 
uh, in some of the other iterations, whether the executive order or the Senate bill has passed. I would note that this is less burdensome, frankly. I think one of the versions that was passed originally it actually required a contractual term so that there would be a contractual term that, that this was all um, set out in, in a contract with, with the state. In this case, it actually provides the secretary, with the language that's before you, provides the secretary with a way to just make that determination, then the certif certification issues, um, and then uh, there would be the, the standard procurement uh, policy. So, I, There's nothing in here that says what happens if uh, an ISP gets a certification and then falls out of compliance. Falls out of compliance. Or so say more about what you mean by that. Um, so they get the contract to stay. Mm -hmm. And then at some point down the road, they say, this isn't working for us. We're going to change our policy so that we're no longer in for compliance. Mm -hmm. So that's a, an interesting point. Um, one question, I guess, you know, for your committee to determine would be, do you want to put in some kind of a mechanism whereby if an entity, if an ISP changes uh, its policy, it would be required to give notice to the state uh, to that effect? Now, you have essentially a, um, an annual disclosure requirement. So theoretically, what would happen is if somebody six months into um, either a contract with the state or theoretically they've also disclosed to the public that's been posted to a website that they're complying with net neutrality standards if they wanted to change that um, they presumably could give notice to DPS or our office whoever the agency is at any time just like any other notice that the state receives providers can while there might be an annual notice requirement typically a commercial entity can always file a new notice it supersedes the prior notice if you want to make that explicit you certainly could with respect to the certification um, that is a different question that might be a question you want to pose to um, the, either the, you know, the administration <coughs> vis-a-vis, if it's going to be issuing a cert certificate of some kind, how, how would they get notice um, that so somehow the certification might be affected? If somebody intentionally, you know, if they change their policy and they don't provide any notice whatsoever, or they're willfully sort of obscuring that, then theoretically you have a Consumer Protection Act violation, because that would be an unfair or deceptive act that they're representing that they're abiding by certain principles, and they have a Theoretically, in the example you referenced, they have a contract with the state. They also have a disclosure uh, with the state in another uh, agency. And so if then they are um, kind of hiding that, that, that change or, or essentially misrepresenting that fact, that would be a Consumer Protection Act violation. Right. So. Uh, but we could also put something in there that if uh, they do change their policy with respect to net neutrality, they would be required to um, file those changes, and the Secretary of Administration or whoever's doing it would have the option of reviewing the uh, terms of the contract. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think, so and in, in this, uh, the bill before you um, already, of course, there is the waiver provision. So theoretically, you know, that would then allow the secretary to say, we need more time to find another provider if we're going to elect to do that. Um, and so um, therefore, if they're going to change their operations to ensure that there's no you know, blackout or loss of service in the interests of Vermonters, they could theoretically extend that. But there, the, you could introduce a notice provision for change of circumstances, for example. Um, we don't have a waiver in this, right? We well, don't have a general waiver. No. We have a waiver for paid prioritization that's consistent with the 2015. So, so that, that would be a new element that you would mm -hmm. need to ask your, your council can, to, to can draft. The state choose? Do business with a with a with a uh, company that's not in compliance. 
My understanding under this, the procurement policy of the state would be that they would not enter into those agreements. They that there's a not. there's a requirement that that the commercial actor with whom they're doing business is certified net neutral. What the bill doesn't do, this before you, is require every commercial actor to be net neutral. It's up to the state to make that determination and then issue certification to those who are, and then it could enter into contracts with those providers. So. I mean, the state has a waiver paragraph. Executive order. Does. Executive order. Executive order has a waiver. Paragraph. Has a waiver paragraph. What the bill before you has is a waiver of the um, paid prioritization. Yeah. Thanks. So again, I, I think how broad or how narrow you want to craft a waiver provision is. Um, Which page is that it's on? It's a policy determination. Maybe I wasn't here to that. make. Uh, Marie, do you know what page that is on the Which, what waiver? The uh, waiver uh, provision for waivers. paid prioritization. Page ten, yeah. I think. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Probably I must have walked yeah. out for that one. Okay. Robin. Um, so I <clears throat> bear with me as I go down this path a little bit. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking if. Uh, so AT&T says they're compliant for consumer and all the um, consumer provisions. Uh, and that's fine, but I'm wondering if, so AT&T also has not a contract with the state, but is providing the, the first net mm -hmm. services. If, and I don't know how this would be, but if they're not compliant on FirstNet services, they are on consumer uh, provided consumer service. Um, would the state, because they're not compliant across the board, the state would not enter into a contract and I don't even know if this is a possible scenario, Chuck. I don't know that, how those lines work. In, in, in my view, the, 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 what you're trying to achieve here is a, basically a declaration mm -hmm. that a commercial entity, uh, an ISP, is abiding by net neutrality principles or not. And if they are, then this, the procurement policy of the state of Vermont will be that they will enter into contractual arrangements with those providers. Um, those ISPs can operate in the state of Vermont regardless of whether they make such uh, a, a declaration that they're going to remain net neutral or not. They can provide those services to consumers and let consumers decide based on the disclosures they're going to make to the general public. So you're going to have a certification program on the one hand that leads to, uh, that's a procurement policy of the state that leads to contractual arrangements with the state as a consumer, you're going to have maybe some of the same providers who provide, uh, you know, enter into contracts with average consumers as well, and consumers are going to decide for themselves who's made a declaration that they're <coughs> neutral and who hasn't. Now, we've been hearing, I think, um, that a lot of providers are, have represented that, you know, net neutrality principles are are things that they believe in or support uh, and presumably may, may continue on, on that path. Um, so the, the disclosure requirements are going to tell us that. Mm -hmm. You're going to know. And every consumer is going to know. So when we, when we talk about broadband, I think the first thing we think about is what we have to our home, uh, you know, whether it's DSL or VTEL. So, but now if I think of AT&T, I think of AT&T in Michigan, that's the telephone service, and they got U-verse or whatever fiber there. But now in Vermont, uh, I think AT&T is wireless. So is AT&T considered, uh, they're wireless, or are they uh, considered an ISP uh, in, in Vermont? 
uh, because so they're wireless. Uh, that's that's a great question for your regulatory authority. So there's no regulatory authority. <laughs> Corey, you're a regulatory. Wait, Purvis. Oh, he's not good. Okay. <laughs> so I would leave that to again to uh, that, that's that's an issue that DPS can better acquaint you with and sort of dive into the details of. Uh, we'll defer to them on sort of who fits under what category uh, of provider. So. so, well, to that point, mm -hmm. I would think that state employees have cell phones, and a lot of them could have AT and T, C mm -hmm. and say have the greatest coverage. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, would that be considered a contract with the state uh, when uh, state employees have cell phones with AT and T? That's a legal question. So, all very good, detail-oriented questions. I think that the bill before you is pretty straightforward in terms of saying, if you are an ISP provider. You have certain disclosures you're going to have to make, and if the secretary finds that you're abiding by the principles as set forth in the bill, there's going to be certification. Mm -hmm. They're going to be allowed to enter into contracts. Now, which contracts specifically and how that rolls out across state government, mm -hmm. um, I don't know how broadly or how narrowly you want to try to define that vis-a-vis um, -vis a question like the one you pose okay, well, for state employees, for example. But I think that's an administration question or a DPS question. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions for me at this time? Um, are you going to be meeting with Maria? On yeah, on, on some of the wordsmithing and some of the specific yeah. number of subsets. That Findings. The findings, yes. The list and what, what the fine terms and stuff. Yep, there. absolutely. And, and I think we should get something in there that if a uh, ISP is certified to be compliant and then goes out of compliance, what should happen? Or either way, I mean, you could imagine somebody that has tried operating under the new order and then sees that maybe for either. Uh, you know, they, they notice that they're losing some customers or maybe they want to have access and provide services to the state. They could change and say, nope, we're going to go back and adhere to net neutrality principles. And so a notice for change of circumstances in either direction, I think, seems entirely reasonable. I think we're going to Person well, I was just going to say that for purposes of the state contracts, they have to include terms and conditions saying that they're adhering to net neutrality. If they no longer adhere, it terminates the contract. Oh, I mean, that's the okay. enforcement. You no longer have a valid contract if you're not in compliance. Okay. So I think that was specific to make sure that the contract mm -hmm. includes those provisions so the extent it's enforceable if there isn't compliance. Okay. Have we the contract asked the question of you all, um, or uh, Clay or John Quinn, um, about how we would know that somebody's gone out of compliance? Well, in some respects, that's what Representative Ian, Tat Ian Tachka was just asking about, okay. is should there be a notice for change of circumstances? And that could be just generally, that could go with the disclosure requirement to the general public. Um, that could be noticed to the state if Suppose, for example, um, they don't want to cut the contract short, but they want to give notice you know, 30 days prior to when the contract is going to be up. They could give notice to the state in advance and say, we're not going to renew or we're changing our terms of service. And so therefore, we're, we're out of the running, essentially. But short, just in a sh really kind of shortcutting way, we're expecting that we would find out about this through their providers themselves, notifying us. That's One way would be through the providers. Another way would be through state agencies. Another way would be through consumers, right? Because what they're attesting to is, again, the no throttling, no blocking, no uh, paid prioritization, et cetera. So. so if we have a consumer mm -hmm. that comes forward and says, that we believe there's been throttling, mm -hmm. um, unreasonable throttling. That would, what would happen? So that would go, a complaint would go to the Public Utility Commission? Well, uh, if, it's, if it's a consumer complaint, typically, no, you know, you. yeah, consumer complaints come to us all the right. time. 
And if it's a if it's if the allegation is it's a CPA violation, which is how you've set it out uh, in the bill, then that would fall to enforcement under the Attorney General's office. And so when would the contract, so, okay, so that would fall under your enforcement, and mm -hmm. then when would the contract um, be jeopardy? At what point? Uh, you mean the contract with the state? Yeah. So if they have a contract, they, because they've certified, you have a consumer that's come in that's complained, they've complained to you, you're going through the process, it would be after you make your determination? Well, so it might be two different things, right? So one is if this is a provider that has is serving both the state and general consumers, mm -hmm. meaning everyone, mm -hmm. and there's a, a pattern or practice that's determined that, uh, in fact, they're not abiding by net neutrality principles, yeah. um, then uh, you'd have a situation where our office, I think, would be responsible for enforcement of the Consumer Protection Act the state and the secretary would be responsible for making a determination that the contract is now void because the contract is with the state of Vermont. After you make the determination. After you make the determination. So it's not just oh. a complaint that's going to void their contract. You'd have to make a determination. Well, and, and the attorney general's, just to be clear, so even if the Attorney General's office in any circumstance moves to enforce the Consumer Protection Act, the court decides whether or not there's been a violation of the Consumer Protection Act, right? So the Attorney General's office can investigate, the Attorney General's office can file a complaint yeah. in court to enforce, but it's a court and a judge that will ultimately, ultimately make a determination about whether or not there's been a violation of the CPA. And that's just standard operating procedure. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So Thank we're you. having this come back tomorrow? This, is this coming back tomorrow? Is Chris coming back tomorrow? This bill? Is the bill coming back to us tomorrow? Yeah. I would say so, yeah. Yeah, okay. It's on the agenda for 9 a.m. 9 a.m., great. Um, do you have anything You're here? Uh, yes. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> uh, for the record, I'm Corey Chase. I'm a telecommunications infrastructure specialist at the Department of Public Service. I can't remember specifically what our question was. Oh, we wanted to hear from a network engineer, <coughs> right, about, about throttling, throttling, I believe. Yes. You wanted multiple testimonies on throttling, if consumers can uh, detect throttling, and then um, things of that nature. So our next three witnesses are all okay. uh, throttling the keepers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I have keepers taking care of me. <laughs> <laughs> so that sort of was, we don't have a good sense, or we want to make sure we have a good sense of terms. Um, Clay, do you guys, are you, you're edging that way. Do you want to be together? You guys. Um, I can always jump in if there's okay. something for me to say. Um, so yeah, just uh, can you give us a sense for what uh, what all these things can uh, consist of in terms of the uh, terms of art that, that are in here? Just uh, what is there a differentiation by uh, a company that's managing? validly, my precise choice of terms, <laughs> um, as opposed to someone throttling, throttling, and, and if so, what are those? That, that's the type of thing we're getting at. We didn't know the, precisely what was taking place, and I think even touches, somebody just was headed in the direction of, you know, how, do, how does a consumer just identify it? Um, if, you know, if somebody came in and, when you, and they come to your department saying they're thinking that they've, they've got poor, poor performance on their on their, uh, from their ISP because they think the ISP is doing something untoward. So I would say that this is a relatively new subject. Um, I spoke to you last week, I believe, and described some aspects of network design that 
um, relate to this subject that you're talking about here. And we talked about uh, content delivery networks and the general architecture of a, a modern internet um, query and how traffic flows. Um, I would say that states generally are not, um, don't have a deep bench in examining this kind of issue because traditionally it has been a non-regulated service. Um, there has been, as Maria described, um, efforts by the FCC to change this, but those efforts have changed with the administrations. Um, so I think you asked about throttling, and uh, generally um, that's a very, that can very quickly become a, a, a complicated question. Why? <laughs> <laughs> You know so, <laughs> so you asked why a, a throttling can become complicated. Why, why, yeah, it's why, why because there are so so um, the question can become complicated because there are in a in a for instance if you go back to the previous discussion we had where a consumer was trying to download a movie from some um, edge provider, there are many different instant many different places across the internet that could be causing the kinds of uh, concerns that a consumer might experience as degradation in service. It could be their local connection. It could be their, wire their wireless router. It could be their computer. It could be um, their internet service provider. It could be the content delivery network. It could be um, congestion in the internet backbone. It could be the edge provider. I'm not saying that there, there aren't ways to track it. I'm just saying, I'm answering your question. You, said, you asked, how could such a question become complicated? Um, there are many different things to think about. So we have, where I live, um, the town that I live in is a, has a ski resort. And so it's, our, you know, our regular population is 2,000. You know, on the weekends we can have 10,000. Um, you know, the size of the pipe coming in is the same size whether there's 2,000 or 10,000 coming in. And so on the weekends, sometimes it gets a little slow for some of our customers that are using the one one provider that made that came in here. It can get pretty slow. Um, which I would expect that yeah, to be the case. Right. That seems, and it seems like it's just kind of what happens. Um, but how would you be able to differentiate um, you, you know, or, or our regulators be able to differentiate between that happening or um, you know, like I am slowing down this uh, street full of people who, you know, are from New Jersey, um, and they're not real Vermonters. And, uh, <laughs> we are. Uh, <clears throat> so, how would you be able to differentiate? I believe it um, that that particular kind of question that you raised probably mm -hmm. wouldn't be addressed by the rules that are being discussed here, because that is a discrimination on a local network because people don't like people from New Jersey or yeah, something. Um, right. I think that the issue that we're talking about here is one edge provider, um, let's just say Amazon, and another edge provider, let's just say Hulu. Mm -hmm. um, one of them has an arrangement with the internet service provider, um, and uh, another doesn't. And the internet service provider looks into, the, they use, um, deep packet inspection is a term of art. You can look inside the packets that are traversing a company's network and determine that these are sourced from Hulu and these are sourced from uh, Amazon. And you might um, do prioritization to, in, in those instances when you were talking about how there's a um, not enough capacity and generally everybody is experiencing some kind of degradation. Right. Some packets get through miraculously um, without experience of degradation while others don't. I think that would be an example of the kind of throttling that you've been discussing. So how could you tell, though? So how could you, as a regulator, tell that a company... So if, if I call you and say, I think that, you know, this provider, you know, which is not aligned with this... This ISP provider, which is not aligned with this edge provider, is slowing that service down. What would you do? How would you investigate that? I think that it would take some some thought 
I don't have an answer for you right away. It would not be a simple task, in my opinion. Um, and um, given that there are so many other problems that could be contributing to that experience, um, the consumer's, I mean, the, the consumer's computer, the computer, consumer's Wi-Fi network, the consumer's modem, maybe the, um, the entire node, node, the cable node that they're on has got problems. I think it, it would take some, some thought, and I don't think that um, we have a, a, a strategy, a, an in-depth strategy in place that sounds like a process of elimination. <coughs> sounds like what? That's process of elimination. Well, troubleshooting is, yeah. is a typical kind of thing that a company would do. When, when you're I asking the question, that's what I was sort of yeah. thinking too, is if I were, the way she was asking, if I were in your shoes in a, a situation like that, I'd probably start asking questions to find out what I can eliminate. Yeah. Until, until you get to yeah, and I would, I would defer to Clay. I, mean, I could speak to is. technical questions, but I would, I would defer to Clay about bigger picture. Uh, we, we <laughs> in, in terms of, of telecom regulation, you know, we petitioned the Public Utility Commission for investigations and were given the authority to investigate uh, telecommunication providers, electric <coughs> providers, gas and water, um, uh, their service, their quality of service, um, their rates, um, and every, uh, most facets of their business. and. We do that, you know. We have an investigation of Fairpoint going on right now, for instance. Um, so, you know, that's something that we're capable of doing. I think the question becomes: in this scenario, with net neutrality, is th that's a that's a public utility um, investigation? Is that the kind of thing that the 2017 <coughs> Restoring Internet Freedom Order, if that's the kind of thing that is allowed. Um, that's very much what public utility regulators do. Uh, and we do in the terms of telecom and electricity. So um, yes, there's, there's methods for that. There are powers to investigate. Um, Asking, you know, through a public utility commission proceeding, asking discovery and um, hiring experts to do that kind of thing. That's um, that's something that we've done for a very long time uh, in in the services that we regulate. So <clears throat> I was going to say pretty much the same thing that uh, maybe. It may not be impossible, but it certainly could be unlikely that you could ever make that determination because um, you could be in, you could start an investigation into it, and conditions could change. You know, very, very uh, instantaneously, the game is over, and everybody stops streaming now, and all of a sudden, you've got uh, faster access. And you would never be able to tell whether whether that uh, uh, is an indication of throttling or not. Uh, I I think it would be very difficult to measure. I, I would react to that and say that I, when I was responding to Representative Billia's question, I was thinking about a specific individual with a specific mm -hmm. consumer complaint. And I think Clay's response was very helpful to kind of frame it in the terms of what we do is very much a regulatory process, and we could, um, if it were subject to the board, public service, public utility commission's jurisdiction, we could bring investigations, and we would probably think more broadly than an, an individual. We, that kind of investigation, you would look for trends, you would look for our indications that there's one company getting preferential treatment or another, and look for a wide, a wider net than an individual. Sorry, didn't. So it is a difficult thing to do, but it is not, not an insurmountable thing to do, mm -hmm. given resources and time and jurisdiction. And looking for trends may be a lot different than from just doing measurements. It would, doing measurement would be part of a looking for trends effort. Okay. Thank you. Hold your hand for you. There you go. I keep changing my <laughs> um, So you mentioned earlier, uh, I forget the term used, but it was a, a deep dive into the 
data being transmitted, and you can maybe see this is Hulu and this is Amazon. What was the deep packet inspection? Deep packet inspection. And is that something that you can do forensically or only in real time? I just wonder what tools are available. There are lots of tools available. It depends on um, <laughs> scope, time, and um, um, money. Um, Deep, deep packet inspection is a, um, a, a tool employed by internet service providers to look at the, kind, the traffic in their network to try and analyze what kinds of services consumers are using. Um, and there are many people who have concerns about privacy that use encryption so that their, um, their information can't be snooped on by their internet service provider. Uh, so going back, is, is that something, again, can you, that be determined forensically, or is it in, you know, as the data is being transmitted? Do you mean if, a, if, if we, determine. for instance, were doing an investigation of an internet service provider to look at their network and s yes. see if they have Looking one of these things? Trends. No, if, if it happened, could you take yesterday's data and examine it? So that would be a question that? for the internet service provider, whether they keep that information, I don't know. Different companies operate differently. So, okay. There's probably not a huge data bank of every packet that's ever been transmitted, but there are probably well, the information about them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Timely uh, warnings. Well, as far as blocking s you don't know the contents if it's encrypted, but you certainly would know the sites that may be blocked, correct? Not necessarily. If, if you were using an encrypted service, a VPN, then the, the ISP doesn't know what you're looking at. Okay, well, not All they know is a packet right, of you to not, not a lot of people are on v, VPNs on the, uh, in their homes, but VPNs aside, okay. I'll, I'll agree to that. So, one of the things that we've been talking about, blocking content, throttling, and again, Network congestion, I can't tell you how many times in my house the internet's slow, and if every time someone says the internet's slow, they're just going to call up the AG office and think they're going to be throttled. They're, they better hire 100 people because the internet can be slow in, in a lot of, unless you're in Robin's house because he has 1G, but, and even then, there can be network con congestion all over the place, I mean, unless we figured out how to get rid of that, so. I think that could be a big consumer complaint driver that, but the thing that I want to circle around to that everyone knows is my favorite topic is, <laughs> is and I see there's a possible uh, waiver. Didn't we vote Didn't we get it? No, you yeah, <laughs> haven't. <yeah, yeah, laughs> <voted. laughs> we offered the promise. We didn't but, get that passport. I support but, but, this and I plan to continue speaking about the waiver sitting on the floor. So. That, uh, about paid prioritization. Uh, so since he hasn't heard my spiel, at least not lately, uh, <laughs> where, where, where it could be of advantage, and, and in fact it is used in the public world, the New York State uh, Thruway, the Garden State Parkway, if you're taking the Lincoln Tunnel into New York, you can get in the bus lane, and, and there's a lot of people that can pay a little more, they'll go faster, and because of that, the other people will go faster too. But So my point is that I think it could be in the public interest to have a limited amount of paid prioritization because we had someone in, in here, they want to do live streaming video. Well, if you're doing live streaming video, it's not going to work very well if you just find out that it's falling apart because of network congestion. So in that case, uh, or uh, telemedicine, if, if I'm at home and a doctor is trying to check check something on my monitor and, and and they're getting uh, blown away because uh, 20 other people are watching Netflix. It may, I think it could be in the public's interest for uh, medical uh, to have prioritization. So, uh, so my uh, sort of suggestion on that is it, it also, if, if you limited it to say 10% 10, 10 of maximum bandwidth could be prioritized, uh, that that could actually incent vendors to have bigger pipes, and 
I'll say I use bigger pipes. I'll have to admit everyone else uses fast lanes. I think it's a misnomer, but okay. I'll, they're they're bigger pipes. You, you can get more water out of the uh, out per second, but everyone else will call it fast lanes. Uh, so, but, and I'm not going to call people on the carpet anymore on that. So, so what what's your what's your thoughts? Does it make sense to have in the public interest to have some limited pay prioritization? I don't think that I can speak for the department on or the administration. <laughs> on who that who, kind of who can speak for the department or the administration? <laughs> <laughs> That's why they call it the hot seat. We want someone to speak for the administration. I could speak about technical questions about how you would manage that, but I think that would well, be you, play about Well, wouldn't that. it be technically p possible? I mean, let's face it, uh, there is these very sophisticated computers called routers and they have their own operating systems and maybe um, think of this if you're trying to prove throttling what are you going to do subpoena everybody's uh, iOS system and tell me tell you what you fed, fed your routers and find out who you're throttling I mean I mean there's all those questions but okay technically is that feasible to say 10 10 percent of this pipe we're, we're going to uh, prioritize um, your, uh, well, I would say wh when you say pipe, which pipe are you talking about? In general, whatever, whatever pipe that fiber, you know, a pipe, so you know, a strand, a strand or whatever. So mean, you mean from a consumer perspective? No, not right? from the consumer, on, on the ISP uh, pers perspective. Really. I think that would be incredibly difficult to try to implement because an ISP, even a small ISP has multiple connections to different backbone providers, and those backbone providers have different connections to different backbone providers, and it's hard to say which one you're talking about when you're... Well, say I'm going from Montpelier to UVM, there's maybe, what, uh, a, a dozen, uh, ten hops, I mean, can they, I mean, there's all these ag agreements how can people get together and say, yeah, we're going to do 10% uh, because I want to know how my heart's doing with my cardiologist. In fact, my blood pressure is probably going up. I want my, <laughs> yeah, it's my cardiologist to, to, to check there. <laughs> I'm animated. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so, so you don't think it's technically feasible to say uh, we, we can prioritize. So, so we're talking about something that's not even possible, that we don't want uh, people to prioritize, and it's not even possible. So what so about first, last review, Laura? What about FirstNet, though? So you know, like yeah, FirstNet public is safety right. for sure. Right. Yeah, that's, but that, that's its own network, is my understanding, mm, right? Well, I think it's. Is it? I mean, aren't they aren't they going to have to use I the back? We have a representative thinking. <laughs> so I wanted to clarify. They're going to have their own physical network. Yeah, let's know. Uh, let's hear. Hi, Chuck Storrell, so, uh, Public Affairs for at and It's my understanding, and believe me, I don't know all the technical aspects of the FirstNet system, but that the, um, you know, it's a particular slice of the radio frequency right. spectrum mm -hmm. right. that is going to be utilized for that. Right. Um, the, um, the utilization of that is going to be, <coughs> you know, shared with the commercial customers in the normal course of events, and then if there is an emergency, where there's not enough capacity, then yeah, there will be priority given to the first responders uh, on that. As far as the backhaul, yes, I do believe it's a separate backhaul uh, for the, uh, the first net uh, mm -hmm. system, but it, you know, the, 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 there'll be two backhauls for each site because there's going to be one for the commercial, one for the, the uh, first net first responders, okay. um, I believe. And I want to qualify that by saying I could well be wrong on some of this stuff. But that would be great, to, just in terms of technical knowledge, it would be helpful to understand how that relates. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Let me switch. You're going with me. My okay, answer, so, to Warren. so I'm thinking about your, your uh, suggestion, Warren, to set aside a certain percentage of the pipe for uh, priority communications. I think, I think the only way that can be accomplished is if you have dedicated lines. For instance, I've got a neighbor who's a physician, and he, he's being on DSL is always complaining that it's very hard for him to get his x-rays transmitted, right? So you could have a, um, a provider like uh, 
University of Vermont Medical Center that has very good access, very high speed access and everything, but you've got somebody else that they're trying to transmit to that's been limited by the fact, by his own connection. So the only way you can ensure that he's going to have a really good connection uh, that he's always going to be able to get at is to have a specific line that, that, that he has access to that won't be impacted by any other users on or any other content provider on the system, on the network. Well, mean to the premise. I mean, if you've got fiber to the premise, there's not going to be any contention. If you have DSL to the premise from the one spot, it's when you have Comcast, when they're sharing connections, you could have congestion. So the fact whether or not, I'll defer to the tech, I'm not a network engineer, whether or not a sophisticated router can figure out priority traffic and ship that ahead for 10% or wherever it's, whatever the hop is. I, if they can't do that, then I don't know what, why, why are we even talking about network prioritization if they can't prioritize the network anyway? I mean, the assumption is, they're able to do it, so now we're here and they can't do it? I mean... Uh, to clarify, I, they certainly can, uh, an ISP can certainly prioritize different kinds of traffic, assuming it's not hidden behind a VPN, but um, they can prioritize traffic on any kinds of uh, okay, quantities, so but, but it's difficult to say 10% of every tra trunk would be for some special kind of priority, because there's all kinds of different trunks. That would be very difficult to um, ad oversee and administer and regulate. Okay, well, the the companies certainly are capable to prioritize traffic. Okay. Well, I'll have to talk to one of my favorite network engineers and see how they uh, take on this. Okay. Unless, that, unless you're an iOS uh, expert. I'm not certified. an iOS expert. I've, Andrew? I have a, a, a Cisco training, but I'm not current. <laughs> That's a different iOS. Thanks, Corey. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Corey. Do you guys want to open that door? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I should have just right asking, now. I'd love it if you would open that. You're not asking door. people to leave. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks, Chair and members of the committee. Okay. Um, I'm Andrew Crawford uh, from CCTV Center for Media and Democracy. Um, CCTV Center for Media and Democracy. I'm also thanks Orca for recording all of these sessions. It's very mm -hmm. great for people who live further away from the uh, oh, okay. state house. I forgot I'm recording. Um, Yep, and uh, I was asked to give some testimony on particularly throttling and or technical matters that Corey has already touched on. Looks like already uh, testified on earlier. Um, yeah, so I originally submitted my testimony um, in relation to the House 680, I believe, uh, Bill. So. It's obviously the bills have changed substantially now, um, but um, I'm still here to answer any questions that you folks have along the lines of. Um, well, you can probably well, take us along where we just went. There. Did you have anything that you thought you could add to the discussion of throttling versus uh, blocking versus? Uh, Move it on that like that. Oh, great! Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah, indeed. Um, so, as Corey said, yes, um, ISPs can prioritize traffic. That's one of their main tools in being able to provide service even when there are lots of people using services. Um, I would say that um, there are lots of different technology stacks and software stacks that enable them to do that. And in, in addition to you know those physical pieces of hardware and the physical pipes, if you will, be it fiber or copper, um, there are additional um, virtual networks that are now capable of being deployed on top of that physical hardware and those physical networks, those links and those, those physical links. So um, the um, I don't know if people have had a chance to read this, but basically um, all of this stuff um, running on essentially the, the basic TCP <coughs> IP suite or IP protocol, which is sort of the foundation of the interconnectivity that the internet provides us, um, you know, has a lot of benefits in the sense that it's very decentralized. Um, each autonomous system gets to make up its own rules about how it routes traffic. They can enter into our own peering or transit agreements with other providers. Um, it allows a lot of freedom 
for those enterprises to do the things that make sense for their business model. Um, and I don't think net neutrality um, wants to get in the way of that, but I think net neutrality does want to say to people who are buying a service from these last mile providers or these access providers, be it the state itself through a contract or be it through a, a community member and their community buying from a local or a national ISP, um, here are some ground rules about what services we're actually going to be delivering to you when we say we're saying internet service. Just to yeah. make it more specific, mm -hmm. uh, UVM is an autonomous system. Is Correct. the state an autonomous system? Burlington Telecom? And Burlington Telecom definitely is. is I'm this don't UVM, the state? So Yeah, I mean, basically, um, you're an autonomous system if you have been designated by, in our case, the IANA to have the ASN, which is called an autonomous system mm -hmm. number, which says it gives you the ability to route certain IP addresses over the internet. I'm going to get, if you don't want me to get too technical, then no, you can ask me to well, stop. I'm just giving a for instance of who, who is an autonomous system and who isn't. That yeah, so usually it's organizations, educational institutions, people who provide other internet service providers, or people who provide backbone or transit internet services. So it's sort of the, you wouldn't be if, you know, you as a consumer are definitely not an autonomous system because uh, um, you don't have a, the ability to be the authoritative person okay. for the routes to those IP addresses. So those, for the good of the order. Sorry. Um, just, again, um, for build, building this, so how many <coughs> ISNs are there in Vermont? Are we talking 50 or are we talking 500? Oh, autonomous systems. I don't know that number off the top of my head. It's probably <coughs> under 100 for sure. Okay. Um, so, um, mm. but <coughs> globally it's significant. Probably around 60 or 70,000. I don't know the exact number right now. Different, and that's internationally. Um, to say this, okay, so um, moving ahead, sort of a lot of the, the basis of what you're being sold as a consumer if you're being sold internet service, I think the, the, the assumption and the idea is that you're being sold essentially a, a connection to the internet so that you can route packets over IP protocol, the network layer and the transport layer. And so at its most basic, that's what I think for me means internet access. Increasingly, the last mile providers are not just sort of selling you that internet access, but they're also selling you sort of access to their network, if you will. Um, and it's a, a slight change in the business model that is accompanying this regulatory change at the federal level, where there's a switch between um, simply you're just headed out to the internet versus you're headed onto our network, whatever provider is, whether it's at and or others. Um, and there are services on that network that you may be taking advantage of more directly rather than the entire internet, if you will, services that are available to you. So um, some of the tension that results from that change um, is precisely related to this whole discussion of net neutrality. So with that framing, um, the next thing that I'd like to say is that um, what I did in my testimony was I looked at um, a couple of the various uh, methodologies people have used to infer um, traffic congestion, et cetera, from sort of publicly available measurement tools. Um, and so um, the only large scale research that's done on the internet, uh, to my knowledge, is done by um, uh, CADA, which is the uh, Oh, let's see, it's the Center for Applied um, Internet Measurement Analysis. I can't remember the exact. It's in the, it's in the uh, sheet uh, in my testimony. Um, and it uses something called uh, time sequence latency probing. And so that's one technology where they've actually been able to infer congestion between these autonomous systems that operate over the internet. So that's sort of, that's just one <laughs> that's looking at the borders of those ISPs, if you will. It doesn't provide information about what they're doing internally. It doesn't provide information about um, other ways that they might be affecting traffic. Um, 
and it's really it's really just essentially using some really basic tools in the internet protocols in TCP/IP suite to do that testing. So it's not that just like Corey said, it's not that we couldn't figure out, but without the so the measurement infrastructure that Kata uses, which is all voluntary, so people from networks around the globe take these units, they plug them in their networks, and then these research scientists run continuous tests from all of those sites around the globe and build up a base of data. And um, forthcoming, I believe in the next month or two, there's going to be a publication, uh, hopefully, uh, from some of the authors listed in my references. And that will give us a, a bit of a better understanding of the baseline internet congestion between various autonomous systems. Um, because the important thing is if we're talking about enforcement or detecting throttling or detecting any of these um, techniques that ISPs use to manage their traffic, um, we, number one, of course, need a baseline from which to measure. And number two, we need an ability to then measure what someone is experiencing. And I think it's, it's really far beyond really the capacity of most consumers to go through the process of trying to determine if they're actually um, being throttled. I mean, due to the many, many variables that are involved. And these are people doing scientific research papers to get really basic information about not even a definitive determination, but circumstantial determination. So um, there's that. Um, I can, uh, if people have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Sure. Gordon? So, we talk about the content delivery networks, which mm -hmm. so called in some terms, it's the internet's been rewired and that uh, Netflix or whatever, things aren't coming over dynamically from Netflix. There's hundreds of these Netflix servers all over the place. Yeah. So, in a way, that to me is de facto prioritization because they are eliminating their traffic is getting where they want a lot faster if I'm getting going from some other site coming from across the country. Yeah, I mean the the content providers um, as well as the ISPs are have different and slightly competing business models. So, you know, if you're a content provider, it's your job to try and get your content to people so that they have the best experience possible. Um, and if you're an ISP, it depends. You might be also a content provider in many cases, or in other cases, you might be really trying to get people out on the internet faster, for example. Or you may want to <coughs> get more bandwidth coming in from other places. So yep. it's, it's certainly seen, I think, for a lot of ISPs as a win-win. Uh, because they they don't have they'll have less network congestion so so I think part of my point is is it's already the big guys are getting all sorts of priority versus some small media company in Vermont that wants to stream video they're that they're, they're not they're not going to have it it's not a level playing field in, in that regard so no I mean for example like we we operate our own small you know nonprofit cloud. Um, we serve video. It's all hyper local video for people in our community in Burlington. Um, and you know that video originates in Burlington. It doesn't originate at a CDN elsewhere. Right. But a lot of the people that want to watch our your, video your are in Burlington. Your audience. But if someone wanted to watch it in San Diego. Exactly. So then it has then it's going quite a far distance and certainly no one at an ISP in San Diego is giving us any priority at all for that traffic. Um, you know, uh, we have had experiences with some other networks, you know, where we've actually measured the latency and seen that there's a significant latency. But without a systematic way of measuring that over long periods of time and, you know, finding a statistically significant, you know, change in that, you know, it's, it's very hard for us to say, yes, we've been discriminated against, for example. And, uh and yeah, we're getting highly technical. Yeah. Uh, because um, it, it's the constant throughput that you need for for video, correct? I mean, it it, it doesn't matter so much that there could be 
an initial latency, but once the stream starts coming, it just keeps on coming fast, uh, correct? I mean, yeah, there's a lot of technologies that can be used to mitigate latency. The thing that doesn't work with latency is if you have a, something that's very high priority, like a telemedicine application or something that needs live instantaneous two-way. Because it's back and forth, but videos are just... Ship, a lot of data. Ship, yeah, ship it down and, and don't care. I mean, it's not doing handshakes. It's just shipping it down, right? Well, <laughs> I'm not going to get too technical. Depending upon the protocol, it, it does actually act. Oh, those, is all the, the all just handshaking for oh, all that oh, stuff. Okay. But um, anyway, getting to anyway, that. yeah. Um, so in the last part of my amended testimony, I have put in um, sort of the. This, the net neutrality suggestions uh, model language from um, a consortium of organizations um, that looked at this issue on the international level. Um, and I think that that content is, is valuable. I don't know if it has too much bearing on this particular piece of legislation, <laughs> but it certainly has bearing on any a exploratory rulemaking that's part of, that would be part of a later process. Um, me. Um, so my question was if you had specific suggestions for us. <laughs> um, you that, was that, <laughs> that is my specific suggestion, and, and I mean I'll put it out there that you know we're we're an organization that that values sort of the hyper local service we provide, um, and you know because we're hyper local we aren't as concerned um, necessarily about our stuff being viewable in San Diego. But the reality is, is that there might be something in San Diego that our community actually needs to know about. And so in that respect, net neutrality becomes very important for us as we do our operations. So, um, and my suggestions, you know, I, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> so I don't have any great insight on the you know, legality or the um, rights of the state to employ any techniques or so if, standards? If, if we run the risk or the question of an ISP blocking or, or um, what the next term, term is? Throttling. Um, is that going to have an impact on you by definition? I mean, are you absolutely going to get it or is it? Well, blocking is relatively obvious. Yeah. You can detect blocking pretty easily. But is it, did somebody direct blocking at you when you say that or was it just something? I would say I would classify ours as I would classify my per, our personal our experience in the organization as being potentially throttling. It was it it was not a outright we cannot reach our our resources on that. Um, so um, does that help? Yeah, it does. And um, look, yeah, I mean it's a it's a. Um, it was a pretty expansive process, I think, that they used to come up with these. And they actually are, if you read them, they actually are pretty light touch. They actually don't legislate any hard technical uh, requirements on the providers themselves and actually offer a fair bit of leeway to those autonomous system operators in terms of determining their policies. Um, and they even often offer, um, as you mentioned, uh, in special circumstances, the ability for uh, an entity to create a certain separate thing. So a uh, certain separate class of traffic, if you will. Thank so, you very thank much. You. Right. Thank you. Now if we can get telemedicine. <laughs> I think he did it pretty well. well. When I said he was a little bit earlier, other than that, it was a great segue. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Todd so, Young, yep. tell us how you become the health network. Yes, that's me. Um, I'm not sure how you guys want to handle this. Do the I same could... thing I just did, just for this. They, okay, I'm trying to get your voice. Sure, I'm Todd Young. I'm the network director for telehealth at UVM. So my span of scope is not only for our network hospitals in Vermont, but also in New York as well. So, so. tell us how your network. No, tell us how your network uh, operates uh, today. Well, I, I mean, I, I can give you a generalized statement of um, how I think <coughs> net neutrality affects health healthcare in our, our network. I think that probably might not be a bad place to start. Um, you know, as our commitment to health um, uh, around our communities, our strategy is to deploy telehealth strategies um, uh, as a core component of how we provide care today. 
And to do that, um, we're using technologies such as video visits, as you guys just discussed, you know, home patient monitoring and e-visits. Um, and these technologies are really expanding access to care um, through, um, for patients throughout our state. And uh, to provide these types of um, services, we need high quality, um, robust, affordable broadband network services for our, for our patients' homes. <coughs> In a lot of cases, we need uh, good broadband or good ISP connections for um, even some of the services that we contract outside of, um, of our own hosted environment. So you know, more and more, we're using cloud services um, to provide some of the applications that we're using um, within, um, within our, our ecosystem. A good example of that is the Telstra um, platform that we're about to deploy in the next year or so. Um, but even before the repeal of um, net neutrality, we were facing you know, some significant challenges around the network. And you know, we've talked about throttling and all those sorts of things, but you know, one of the things that we really focus on is access um, to network to the last mile for homes and really the cost, and we haven't, I haven't really heard too much about the cost. And we have some real social economic issues making sure that we can provide, you know, some of our, our services out to um, patients' homes with limited means. So limited what? Limited means, you know, incomes. And, um, you know, so those are the things that, um, that we're really focused on is trying to make sure that we can do that because you know, since you guys passed the S50 law last year, um, we're, we're starting to see some great examples of how we are using telemedicine at the homes. A couple examples are, you know, we're providing palliative care out to terminally ill patients in their homes so they don't have to come to the medical center. Or we're providing, you know, primary care to Medicaid patients that, um, that might be working in Rutland and, and uh, uh, you know, we avoid uh, trips up to Middlebury or, or what have you that just happened today and then and then you know our partnership with BNA providing um, home health monitoring and you know those those types of things for both diabetic and and um, uh, heart disease patients that are just coming out of care um, are very vital uh, to providing these services so okay. yeah well we've had dozens of uh hours of discussion about the last mile so yeah we just are focusing on a different aspect here sure. but to the point uh, video okay you're talking two-way video so what mm -hmm. do you what are you looking how many megabits uh, per second do you need to do successful uh, two-way video we're actually having some pretty good luck with a vendor called zoom and zoom, um, they're on the radio too. yeah zoom is on the radio and they can go as low as about one megabit and okay. and so Actually, what you know, what we're seeing is that that actual window is coming down for us. Where a few years ago, <coughs> trying to do that in one megabit and have quality of service um, wasn't wasn't even doable. But okay. uh, Zoom, now it's not your great the greatest service experience at one megabit. You know, you're better at five, but but that is the bar is around one megabit right now. So since a lot of service is asymmetric. Uh, or one, we have a. They're gone. We have a lot of. Our network map is gone. <laughs> but so the four one. It's up on top of the shelf. <laughs> so a, a, a goodly number would be able to do it, but of course there's the people out in the more remote sites that aren't going to get four one. But with that, uh, it seems like you would have pretty decent coverage. But then the next question is. I would think, since you're doing two-way video, that you would want that prioritized over me doing a, a gigabyte download of Microsoft Office. No, you, you made a really good point earlier, and, that, and I, I fully support um, your thoughts in that regard, that <clears throat> I do think there's the opportunity to prioritize public safety type um, traffic, and healthcare would be one of them maybe even education you know some of those types of things over pure content providing for entertainment um there's a there's a rational argument about that well and, and yeah the whole thing with entertainment is that it really doesn't have to be uh streaming video they could just download it uh, mm -hmm. the night before and so i think it's a tremendous 
to me, waste of bandwidth, this live streaming video from Netflix. But because Clay, he has a, a sort of a hybrid system there. He can, he can download it. It's not live streaming with Apple, is it? No, you can download it. Or you can download it. Yeah. So, so, so we would, anyway, it's the whole thing. I think there's a lot of reasons that the internet could work a lot better for a lot of people if, if we had an eye on some sort of uh, rational, regulated uh, prioritization, and obviously telemedicine or the example that uh, an article that I was reading about is remote robotic surgery mm -hmm. uh, type mm -hmm. of thing. I don't, I, don't know, I don't know if you have doctors that do that uh, remotely, but, uh, but it's, it's in the... Yeah, I'll let you speak. Well, Telestroke is a really good example where prioritization really means means something where, you know, we have a window of time where we'll have a neurologist in Burlington trying to provide service um, or care to somebody in Middlebury, and we're having to do live video, um, upload CT um, studies, and, and bring laboratories all together in what's called the magic hour to make sure that we're making the right decision to treat a patient, or transport them, or, or do some intervention at the, at, at you know, at the critical access hospital. Yeah. So, good idea know, to have priority over Netflix. Yeah, I would think For so. Me, at least I, I mean, when it's in our own network, our private network, we can control some of those factors. But as I said earlier, you know, some of the vendors that we're starting to use are, are cloud-based um, application um, providers. So. We have to make sure that our ISP, as a as a larger entity, is providing the pipe the pipe size that we need to provide those services out to every one of our locations. And just a technical aside, is uh, UVM Medical Center an autonomous system, or are they, uh, you know, I don't really. I'm not a network engineer, no, and okay. I can't really answer that question. Of course, they've really confused everything: the UVM Hospital and the UVM University. But that's a whole other. Problem. Yeah, that's an, that's another discussion. <laughs> Anyway, thanks. You're, you're uh, welcome. I'll let someone else. Other questions? Good. Last little last end of the stick, I guess. I get one. Wait, one yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, I think it was last year we passed H50 or Act 50. S50. Yeah. S50. Yeah. Um, third try, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I guess so. You've talked about a number of ways that it's being utilized. Do you anticipate a lot of growth for mm. that? Oh, yes. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the law was just enacted like October of last mm -hmm. year, and, um, you know, I was actually hired into the, into the UVM network last June in anticipation of the law, and we're making major investments in, in telemedicine across, across our, uh, our network. You know, us being an academic medical center and, um, at Burlington and providing our specialty care out to both rural communities and, and our other network locations, uh, we, we see a huge uplift, um, not only with our network affiliates, but Rutland and others that we're working with. So, mm -hmm. yes, you're, you're going to see a lot so, more of that. So a lot more demand. Oh, yeah. Uh, the cons yeah cons <laughs> there's a lot of consumer demand um, in regards to providing services at home. Um, mm -hmm for both for urgent care, follow-up visits, and, um, and things like palliative care, surgical follow-up, all those types of things where providers don't necessarily need physical contact but just need to, to be able to have an interactive transaction with the, mm -hmm. the patients. Visual check. Yeah, visual check. Mike. Yeah, do you find that you have better uh, <coughs> communication capability between your different hospitals in your network? as opposed to, say, your hospital and an individual doctor someplace in Vermont? Uh, I mean, that's, that all depends on the connectivity that the, doc, you know, the doctor might have it within their home. But right. um, I will mean, say, As far as hospital to hospital? Hospital to hospital, those are private them? networks where, where we're, you know, we're controlling, <laughs> um, you know, the bandwidth in, in our own network within when then so we have a private network between the medical center and uh, central Vermont medical center so private we network being direct line between one hospital yes or at least fiber everybody else shares with you yes so so we can we can control those factors once we once we go out into the ISP land um, then things get a little bit more variable right. yeah. what's the nature of the private network is it a T1 line or what 
Um, it, it, yeah, it's fiber. It's fiber connected. Um, and we're like we're we're pulling. Yeah, it's like one point five megabits. Yeah. That's old stuff. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Thanks again. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay.